Bienvenue tout le monde, bon retour à la dernière euh, session plénière de Together Ensemble. Euh, C'est moi Yvon, vous maire de cérémonie encore. Uh, we've come to the end of our programming uh, together, of to put together ensemble, and I've, be, I've enjoyed, I've really enjoyed uh, being part of this. I've really, I've really enjoyed uh, being an MC, and uh, it's been a first amazing uh, MC virtual experience for me so far. Uh, so I hope that I, uh, you know, I was able to guide you through this conference as uh, as good as I think I did that. But I'm not sure again where we will come in. Uh, all feedbacks and suggestions for next time. Uh, but before we wrap up, of course, we go, we're going to have our amazing team of rapporteurs, uh, Jake and his team are going to come back on and uh, basically do a summary of everything else that happened in the other sessions so that we can all uh, be caught up. And yeah, uh, so remember, uh, the first, uh, remember the sessions we, were, we went in today will be available uh, online on YouTube, on the YouTube channel of uh, Together Ensemble. And also our digital content partner, our future future of good, will also be doing uh, the daily digest, which you should be receiving uh, right in your mailbox that you use to register uh, for the conference. Um, so I'm going to turn things over right away to Jacob and his team. Uh, again, Anika, Luca, Mohamed, Namdi, Victoria, and Tia will back to give us one of those amazing uh, summaries and uh, of what happened in. Uh, the conference, the sessions that he attended. So, Jake, uh, if you're here, I'm going to pass it on to you right away. I, I am here or somewhere, uh, Yvonne. Oh, out, okay. Out in, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, gotcha. Exactly. <laughs> I, I, I am here. I'm in a little town called uh, Almont, just outside of Ottawa in the, in the uh, Ottawa Valley. And I feel close to you, Yvonne, because I've always thought of it as a little bit of Alberta in on Ontario. It has a similar <laughs> agricultural kind of rural um, feel. So we're close. Um, it's also unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. Um, so I, as uh, Yvonne has mentioned, and if you've participated for the last uh, day and a half, I'm working with a team of uh, six fantastic rapporteurs, one of each who um, attends each of the, uh, the six sessions or attended each of the six sessions this afternoon. And their job is to listen carefully to the diversity of uh, voices in each of the sessions. And then they have the um, challenging job of condensing 45 minutes to an hour of conversation and presentations into a three minute um, overview. So we're going to hear the six uh, three-minute overviews. I just have to see who is going to um, start first. Um, and uh, okay, so I think we have um, uh, to start. Uh, it's going to be from the uh, elect her session, the, the women's political participation as a conduit for achieving the SDGs. And I'd like to invite uh, and welcome Annika Zaumi to present that summary. Hi folks, so thank you again. My apologies, I'm on my phone because I'm having some issues with my computer, so please bear with me if my screen is a little shaky. Um, so I had the opportunity to take part in the Elect Her panel um, and listen in on some of the really great insights that some of these women shared about particularly women's political participation um, and not just women's par political participation as a whole, but rather how women's part uh, political participation cannot effectively be achieved without representation from all individuals, from all um, diverse identities. We started off with Leslie Tete, who's a moderator and a youth advocate with the Ontario Council of International Corporations, um, OCIC, who shared um, a little bit about why it's so important to talk about gender equality in not just institutional but also non-institutional spaces in public office and why the role of policy is diff is different um, but also has many barriers for marginalized and underrepresented women um, it was really interesting because what she highlighted is that sdg5 gender equality has more than one definition, experience and story depending on what background or what identity people come from um, and as a result, this uh, panel kind of highlighted individual stories and experiences to understand how policies affect our life and engagement in Canadian space. First off, we had Far Farah Sochun, um, from who is a disability advocate um, and who talked a lot about PACs or political action committees, which is what people are typically familiar with within the U.S. electoral landscape. Um, 
and they tend to be quite controversial and they're in illegal in Canada, but she shared how um, the implicit or explicit support of corporations in Canada kind of sets up a similar structure here um, within our electoral spaces and how marginalized and underrepresented individuals, including people from the community of people with disabilities, can use this as an opportunity to really create strong unions and strong supporting organizations to back women, um, particularly those from historically underrepresented communities to be involved in electoral processes. Next, we had Jess Notwell, who's an Indigenous PhD candidate, who talked about how um, gender equality cannot be achieved without Indigenous um, reconciliation without acknowledging and honoring the original Indigenous epistemologies and understandings of uh, of uh, governance here in Canada. Um, and she talked about how settler colonialism has imposed uh, methods of government and governance within Indigenous communities and on this Indigenous land here in Turtle Island, but how in order to achieve actual gender equality, um, and especially gender equality that is representative, uh, we need to go back to those original forms of governance. Next, Christina Muya, who has worked with the UN, shared about um, the power of, once again, these political action committees and supporting groups such as Black women in uh, gaining uh, spaces and voices within uh, electoral processes um, and how there's a need to allocate resources and engage marginalized communities within these processes. And finally, Anam Rashid, a student united uh, at University of Toronto um, shared the importance of women's representation and suggested that in order to achieve effective gender equality and women's representation, particularly of those who are underrepresented, we need to do two things. First, we need to decolonize space. And secondly, we need to harness the power of PACs and the PAC model to support women to gain these spaces. Thank you. Annika, thank you uh, so much for that su concise uh, summary and for so gracefully dealing with the, uh, your, your tech challenges there. Um, uh, I'd like to pass the baton now to the prochain rapporteur, Victoria Tan, who will talk about the session of Verdissement Urbain ou Redonner du Verre à la Ville. Ah, merci beaucoup, Jacob. Donc, euh, bon après-midi à tous. Donc, le panel Le verdissement urbain ou redonner du verre à la ville de multiples bénéfices sous-estimés a réuni Mme jo Joanne Elsener de l'organisation Sa Marche Doc, M. David Vien du Conseil régional de l'environnement de la capitale nationale et M. Antoine Paquet-Moisan, donc du Jour de la Terre. Cinq questions très intéressantes ont été abordées durant ce panel. Pour commencer, le, les bénéfices du verdissement urbain ont été présentés. Euh, le verdissement permet d'avoir un impact positif pour les humains, notamment sur notre bien-être et sur la santé. Très, par, euh, par exemple, donc 39 des gens qui ont accès à plus d'armes ont beaucoup moins de stress euh, que les gens qui, euh, qui vivent dans les quartiers qui sont un peu plus denses. Euh, le verdissement permet d'inciter à l'activité physique, ce qui permet une diminution de 40 de l'obésité et de 13 de l'hypertension, donc très, très, de très grands bénéfices. Par après, la diminution des coûts de santé permet d'avoir une diminution de, des coûts sur le système de la santé. Par exemple, au Québec, 28 milliards euh, découlent des maladies cardiovasculaires et avec le verdissement, une diminution de 1 permettrait des économies de 1 milliard de dollars. Évidemment, le verdissement permet de toucher à 8 ODD, ce qui permet euh, de, de toucher à plusieurs objectifs du développement durable, d'avoir des impacts qui sont considérables sur plusieurs volets ce qui amène à avoir une meilleure résilience pour nos villes. Pour avoir un projet qui, est, qui, a, qui a un succès pour nos villes, c'est de toucher plusieurs aspects de notre vie, de mobiliser la communauté, d'établir des partenariats avec le secteur privé et le secteur public, mais également nos villes. Les citoyens sont amenés à jouer un rôle important pour mobiliser et interpeller nos élus concernant cette problématique. Évidemment, pour participer euh, à ce verdissement, les, les citoyens peuvent euh, contribuer au, euh, dans, dans leur communauté en interpellant les écoles de leurs enfants, de faire part des bénéfices à leurs patrons et de montrer leur engagement à s'impliquer. Euh, un des sujets importants qui a été abordé, c'était les freins au projet de verdissement. Euh, le premier frein était le fait d'avoir euh, beaucoup trop de place euh, pour nos autos. 
à Montréal, c'est 30 à 40 de l'espace public qui est dédié à l'entreposage privé, donc à l'automobile. Il faut repenser comment on construit, on aménage nos espaces urbains. Par ailleurs, euh, la conception euh, de, nos, de nos immeubles à béton euh, est conçue selon euh, une idéologie qui est plus facile, donc une approche de facilité. Donc, c'est vraiment une gestion du changement qui est apportée, et surtout avec le temps de la COVID, un élément important à intégrer. Euh, le financement est aussi une barrière pour l'établissement de projets urbains. Le Québec propose d'avoir au moins 1, 1 d'investissement dans les fonds publics pour verdir les CPE, donc les, les garderies, les écoles, les hôpitaux, et euh, de rechercher à avoir au moins un indice de 35 de, euh, pour un indice de canopée pour avoir des bénéfices recherchés. Les villes sont importantes, elles jouent un rôle pour euh, les règlements municipaux et il faut discuter avec les promoteurs. Donc, j'invite à voir euh, le résumé de la présentation et la présentation en différé. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup uh, pour cette uh, résumé, Victoria. And um, our next, uh, it really made me think you mentioned the, be the benefit of uh, trees in our communities. And it made me think that this morning, you know, here in the Ottawa Valley, the trees are just leafed. And this morning was the first morning that I heard the sound of the leaves blowing in the, in the wind and the kind of calm that that brings and the importance in our lives. The uh, next uh, summary of a session is Pathways to sustain Sustainable Land Use in Canada. And I'll pass it over to Tia Brearley. Hi everyone, my name is Tia Brierley and I'm from the University of Waterloo. The session I just watched was titled Pathways to Sustain Sustainable Land Use in Canada, where we were joined by Sophia Murphy from the International Institute for Sustainable Development, Dominic Broser from UBC's Department of Forest Resource Management, and it was led by Hisham Zarifi from UBC's Faculty of Forestry. The session was packed with information, talking at a high level of some of the challenges and opportunities that land use sectors pose for sustainability, highlighting specifically agriculture and forestry moving to 2050. In Canada, one third of the surface area is forest, uh, and the forestry sector employs over 200,000 people. The agriculture sector contributes $100 billion to our GDP and employs 2.3 million people. So as you can imagine, these are two crucial industries. Throughout the panel, there was a focus on the FABLE framework, which stands for Food, Agriculture, Biodiversity, Land Use and Energy. We were given an overview of the different modeling frameworks that exist in our current scenarios with medium ambition scenarios and high ambition scenarios to display what we need to do based on these frameworks to achieve our domestic targets in these areas while still being driven by consumption patterns. As we become more sustainable, these models display that we can actually become more self-sufficient in Canada. Sophia then highlighted some of the issues in the agricultural industry using COVID-19 as an example. During this crisis, our food system has been resilient and bounced back rather quickly, but we relied heavily on people who are paid poorly and marginalized. Farmers in our communities are the ones going with unsold and rotting food. This displays a deeper issue in our food system and the power that certain parties have. COVID-19 presents an opportunity for us to grow out of this pandemic with a new view where we can transform the food system into a more sustainable food system, focusing more on local. Sophia then mentioned that it will look what it will look like for us going into 2050, highlighting a statistic that assuming the politics in trade allow that up to one in two people could be reliant on imported cereal as a staple food. This is because of what's happening in our global food system and what we need to help moving forward. Dominic then provided us some information on the forestry sector. He highlighted forests in Canada are publicly owned, which presents both challenges and benefits. In Canada, we are heavily focused on uh, industry use in our forests. He then highlighted where he thinks we'll be in 2050 as forests play a major role in the bioeconomy moving forward. He highlighted that we are starting to make car parts and cosmetics out of wood. Exciting developments are happening, but they don't happen if we don't have forests to sustain them. The forest industry is currently based on commodity products in Canada and is partially dependent on the U.S. housing market. He highlighted that there will continue to be a reliance on these products 
and that it won't change fundamentally in the short term, but we need to increase our opportunities in Canada for more local production. He continued to mention how important it is to manage the forest, forest sustainably moving forward. Overall, this was a great chat on two major industries in Canada, agriculture and forestry, and where we can see these sectors moving forward. Thank you, Tia. And um, our next uh, reporter is on the, about the sustainability in the cultural sector. And I'll invite um, Namdi Akabwezi to fill us in on that session. Thank you, Jake. Um, and hello, everybody. Jake, I hope you can see me. Yeah, definitely can. Okay. <laughs> so, um, hi, everyone. My name is Namdi Akabwezi. I'm a research assistant with, uh, at the University of Waterloo. I had the pleasure of uh, attending the session on sustainability in the cultural sector, which uh, had four, speak four interesting speakers in it. Uh, so some of the key words uh, that uh, kept coming up there were indigenous people, indigenous culture, heritage, cultural sites, and sustainability. Yeah. So the theme of the session was actually, how do we embrace culture in all its aspects, such as, uh, intangible heritage, natural heritage, built heritage, the arts and then cultural like, expression. And so the key question that came up was, how does culture in Canada contribute to the implementation of the 2030 SDG, Sustainable Development Goals and its agenda? And so the moderator, um, Catherine, noted that this, uh, Canada is actually doing a lot to uh, implement uh, uh, the SDG goals while embracing culture and, and heritage. Uh, so the first speaker, Claude, who is the acting president of uh, Indigenous Heritage Circle, which is dedicated to the advancement of First Nations, uh, noted that many of the guiding principles associated with uh, Indigenous heritage can actually be realized in the fulfillment of the 17 uh, SDG goals. Uh, uh, so he um, further noted that the uh, coronavirus pandemic has affected a lot of cultural sites that usually attract people uh, during the summer. And this has greatly impacted uh, um, on the income of these sites. So uh, what the Indigenous Heritage Circle did was to write a recommendation to the government of Canada to provide uh, some stimulus, uh, stimulus funding for some of these heritage sites uh, because these heritage sites, or as he called it, Aboriginal sites, they embody the culture and history of a certain group of people. So it's very important to keep them alive and to keep them going. Uh, so the fundamental question he tried to ask here is how can we recognize the fact that indigenous culture and indigenous cultural sites can provide valuable insights into how culture intersects with the SDG? For instance, uh, he gave an instance with the Yukon ice patches, which are a representative of a rare concern for the indigenous people there because of the effect of climate change. You know, we all know that the uh, climate change is, uh, is affecting the ice patches a lot. So, so therefore there should be a call for nations to work towards reducing greenhouse uh, emissions. So indigenous people also have a right to maintain and preserve their cultural uh, heritage. So therefore, there should be more collaborative approaches with these indigenous communities to work towards this in order to help achieve the SDG uh, goals. So there, uh, another speaker, Ivana, um, has, um, stated that there's a need to make sure that we, ha we promote and sustain cultural diversity because we all have different cultures and heritage. So quality education about culture should be embedded in our edu education systems you know, to help to foster this. Also, the promotion of human rights and fundamental freedom for culture and heritage should also be promoted while vulnerable groups, such as migrants, rural communities, indigenous communities, uh, and, and other groups uh, should have a right to their cultural identity. And this should be widely recognized. So the third speaker, Christopher, uh, noted that uh, we need to do more to highlight the relationship between culture and sustainability. So it is uh, worthy to note that a lot of these indigenous communities uh, are having their culture 
and heritage depleted or oftentimes not uh, duly recognized. So the organization he works with, uh, they focus on cultural heritage and the relationship between people and places. Uh, so he noted that although there is a distinction between people and places, there's also a huge relationship between these two. Uh, so in order to ensure that cultural heritage is protected, policies have to be designed and uh, promulgated for, for this to be achieved. So we need to get governments all over the world to promote policies that will protect uh, cultural heritage, especially for indigenous groups. Uh, so uh, the, the other speaker, Cordy, uh, uh, who focuses on arts, um, gave an instance about a UNESCO summit uh, on climate change, which he attended recently, where he came across this organization called Jewish uh, Bicycles that measures the uh, carbon footprints uh, and its impact uh, in Europe and uh, UK. Uh, so he recommended that this model uh, should be embraced by other organizations uh, uh, so that the SDG goals you know, can be achieved by 2030. Thank you. Nandi, thanks so much for that. Uh, that's that really interesting summary. And um, I just remind folks that in the next couple of, um, uh, by some point next week, all of the session presentations will be uh, online on YouTube. And um, everyone involved in the conference will get an email um, or contact through social media and know that uh, in, in fact that uh, the uh, sessions are online. And I, I think particularly about that because I found that so interesting and I'm, I'm so glad that uh, there was a session on culture in the, in the conference because it's often the invisible glue that holds a society together. And that without addressing that, you know, it often, you wonder why there are uh, roadblocks and they're often the invisible uh, cultural ones. So thank you, uh, Namdi. And I'm going to, the next uh, presentation is um, on the SDGs and higher education with Lucas Moffat as the rapporteur. Lucas, over to you. Hi, everyone. So my name is Lucas from the University of Waterloo. And the session I was listening in was on the SDGs and higher education by Candy Ho, Carolyn Hatch, Beth Eden, and Katrin Cole. And there's a lot of information covered, so I'll keep that in mind in my three-minute summary, but basically the key themes we talked about were incorporating SDGs into the classroom, how you can basically use the work you're already doing, um, and connecting that with SDGs, right? Uh, there is a methodology that was called the funnel approach, so looking at what your long-term aspirations in terms of your career or your goals are, and moving down the funnel to see what activities you can do, and basically in terms of what you can begin doing immediately, um, whether that's in the university or whether creating different organizations. Uh, and so one of the things which was pretty innovative was in the classroom, basically incorporating SDGs. Oftentimes in the university classes, uh, folks will cluster themselves into groups based on their faculty. Uh, but what this actual class did was they had people determine what SDGs they wanted to work on and organize themselves into groups that way. And the use of what we call renewable assignments rather than disposable ones. So oftentimes in university, you know, we'll learn something and work on something, submit it, and then kind of forget about it where the renewable assignments really have an emphasis on this lifelong learning and how, you know, the participation in those assignments can help shape and create a framework uh, for your cognition moving forward. Uh, there's a couple organizations mentioned, uh, Katrin who works with CIRAD, and what they're looking to do is basically create a summer school to be held in Montreal in 2021 to focus on a social innovation ecosystem to pilot the training of individuals who aspire to be agents of change and fostering global citizenship and human flourishing. So some of the key terms um, kind of repeated were about the global citizenship the development of concrete skills and concrete action. Um, and additionally, we, it was elaborated on the fact that these vulnerable communities, which have been deeply impacted by sustainability challenges, whether economic, environmental, or social, are even further impacted by the COVID-19 crisis currently because of their situations. Usually they're living in very close quarters, densely packed, and are often the ones who are working in situations, um, you know, exposed to potentially COVID-19. Uh, we also spoke about the emphasis on women empowerment um, and so having, you know, a high level of women involvement in terms of shaping the future to kind of address all aspects as well as 
uh, career ninjas and movement led by Candy. And lastly, more important than ever, uh, you know, incorporating the huge potential of students, giving them a seat at the table and using the passion and knowledge that they already have and allowing them to be change makers themselves. So, thank you. Thanks, Lucas, for condensing that so uh, so absolutely concisely. And I know a lot of people will be interested in the um, in the, the the training workshop you mentioned in Montreal in uh, 2021. And again, that information will be available uh, in the in the uh, YouTube video, or perhaps will come out uh, in a uh, a separate email. My ears perked up at that, and probably others did uh, too. And uh, we've arrived at the uh, last rapporteur session for the conference. And it's on the SDGs and sustainable procurement with Mohammed Koy. I'll turn it up to Mohammed. Hi, everyone. My name is Mohammed, and I'm from the University of Waterloo. If you didn't get a chance to join the SDGs and sustainable procurement session, here are some of the key highlights. Um, the speakers were Eric Sarvala from Black Cloud Canada, uh, Bob Willard, Anne Marie Saunier from XPAR, and Jane Zhang from Edge Sourcing. Um, so we started off that session with a definition of sustainable procurement, which is ensuring that businesses procure sustainable products and services and that they buy from companies that are more sustainable than others, which are also known as sustainable suppliers. Sustainable procurement can be looked at from uh, two sides, the sustainability of the supplier or the products. And this could be in the form of verifying whether suppliers or products and services that a business procures are more energy efficient less wasteful, made from recycled products, emit less carbon dioxide or other gases when they are being operated or manufactured, among other criteria. Governments can also help encourage businesses to be more engaged in the SDGs. Governments should make it a requirement for businesses to disclose how they are contributing to the SDGs. Um, and currently the federal government of Canada spends $20 million every year on goods and services themselves and that can be a starting point for them to implement their own sustainable procurement practices and then encourage businesses to be aware of sustainable procurement. Um, Anne-Marie Saunier, uh, in 2018, uh, Anne-Marie worked with uh, governments, public entities, nonprofits, and other organizations to create ECPAR, which is an organization focused on responsible purchasing practices. Um, Anne-Marie researched environmental conditions, working conditions, and behaviors of manufacturing and apparel companies in Guatemala to help improve their laws on SD, on working conditions. And she also provided a, a good reminder that the SDG that sustainable procurement uh, connects to here is SDG number 12, which is sustainable consumption and production. Um, and then Jane Zhang, the co-founder of Edge Sourcing that was a panelist on that session as well, um, told us that the core service of her uh, organization at sourcing is around sustainable procurement and its role in how businesses consume and operate sustainably. Uh, she had mentioned that even five years ago, trends like reusable straws, cups, and other products were not as prominent as they are today. And changing consumption patterns allows for a greater impact of sustainability within consumers, but it also has a very similar effect for how businesses uh, spend because how businesses spend is through their own consumption patterns as well. Um, and she mentioned that businesses can uh, begin to drive waste reduction, improve consumption impacts within sustainable procurement, and that really sustainable procurement is just traditional procurement with the added lens of sustainability to identify business value improvements. Um, for businesses, they really have to embed sustainability. Um, all of the panelists agreed that sustainable procurement really helps change the perception of how businesses can adopt the SDGs. And that's it from that session. Thanks so much, Mohammed, for uh, wrapping things up so, uh, so concisely. And I'd like to thank the, uh, the entire uh, rapporteur team, Annika, Victoria, Tia, Namde, Lucas Mohammed for just a fantastic job of um, uh, being the ear on the wall and, and bringing us in, all into each of the uh, six sessions this afternoon and uh, this morning and the, and the uh, four yesterday uh, afternoon and the, in, the, in the morning. 
I, I think they did a, a remarkable job of quickly capturing the, the spirit and diversity of, of conversation and presentation in those uh, sessions. And as I'm getting, as I begin to think about writing the report, um, one thing I would encourage you to do as a participant in the, uh, in the conference is that if you, if there's been something particularly meaningful for you that you've heard, if there's, if there's an idea that sparked uh, uh, reflection on your part, part um, something from the conference that's been particularly, uh, you know, an important learning moment for you or that's uh, sparking action, let the conference organizers know, send them, a, send them an email, send them a note. I know you're also going to probably get uh, a, an email asking for um, input about your experience with the conference. And, and um, that input is going to be really important for me in, in engage because especially given the, um, the online uh, format, uh, giving the organizers and me a sense of the, the breadth of conversation that happened and um, uh, where, where we're moving to, uh, you know, in the, in the next phase of our, uh, in the next phase of our work. So um, I, that's all for me, uh, Yvonne, and I'm ready to pass the baton over to you. Awesome. Um, je voulais dire uh, merci encore beaucoup à l'équipe de Jacob. Uh, encore, vous faites un travail magnifique et on a vraiment, vraiment hâte uh, à voir le rapport uh, au, début, au début de cet été. Uh, merci encore à Jacob, à Jacob et son équipe. Uh, tout de suite, uh, before I forget, uh, I also, before I forget again, I also wanted to mention that uh, if you didn't get a chance to uh, check out the um, uh, solution spot, uh, spotlight, uh, the northern, uh, the northern perspective on the SDGs, please go check out the website. I had the uh, opportunity to do it uh, during my break, and it was. It's beautiful. The website is beautiful, and it really shows you that uh, again. The SDGs, the goals are going to be are going to look different for each of us, depending on where you're from, where you live, what's your background, and a lot of different things. I really uh, enjoyed uh, looking at that website. It's really, really visually appealing, and the stories on there are also uh, yeah, they are just amazing stories that need to be told and that need to be heard. Uh, so thanks again uh, for uh, for that segment on. The de, on the schedule. Euh, donc, euh, prochainement, euh, nous, avons la, nous allons avoir quelques remarques finales euh, de clôture de son honorable Elisabeth Dozwall, euh, la lieutenant gouverneure de l'Ontario. Euh, puis, je serai de retour pour officiellement clore la conférence au complet et euh, remercier euh, toutes, les personnes, toutes les personnes et les organisations impliquées. Uh, so, we're going to have uh, right away. Uh, the, uh, a few words, final remarks from uh, our, uh, some, uh, our, the honor Elizabeth Dotswa, uh, who is the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. Hello, everyone. Bonjour, bonjour. Je suis ravi de me trouver avec vous encore une fois, même si de façon virtuelle. I want to begin by saying thank you. Your decision to go through with this conference during these uncertain times says a lot about your commitment to the SDGs, and you've convened an amazing group of experts and practitioners. I dare say that had this conference been held four months ago, my remarks might well have been different. To be sure, I would have tried to be encouraging, reinforcing your efforts to make real progress on sustainability. But now, as never before, we are experiencing tumultuous change. That was so clear in the presentations by both Jeffrey Sachs and Tad Homer Dixon. We see firsthand the real impact of our global interdependence, geopolitical shifts, and amazing technological opportunity. But we're also seeing in devastating ways the fragility of our social, health, and economic systems and challenging paralytic policies and institutions. A pandemic has really turned the world upside down. And while we are focused on the here and now, on the immediacy of this pandemic, I remain convinced that the sustainability framework of inclusive prosperity, environmental stewardship, and social justice and cohesion will serve us well as we move forward. I can tell you from six weeks of reaching out to Ontarians that they are seeking resilience. 
and learning to live with both the positive and negative results of a pandemic gives much greater clarity and definition to the elements of sustainability. The stories of hardship and inequality are poignant indeed. Anxiety and hope in equal measure. We're being challenged by lack of food security for marginalized groups. We'll certainly be retrofitting public spaces to accommodate physical distancing. We'll be thinking seriously about business continuity and risk along with new geopolitical and security implications. We will be designing redundancy into IT systems upon which we've become so dependent. And we'll be having conversations about how to tra trace and track infections and still preserve individual privacy. And we'll be seeing the physical and psychological impacts upon families when placed under conditions of isolation. What gives me hope are the wonderful stories I've heard, stories of collaboration and empathy, creativity and courage. All orders of government working together in common cause. Scientists and researchers with single focus racing to develop a vaccine. And in fact, have you noticed that trust in science has been at the heart of evidence-based policymaking. Industries retooling their production lines, the testing of more sustainable financial models, the potential healing of nature as drivers of pollution are reduced, and the empowerment of citizens as they build community. Certainly, there are many who simply want this all to be over and life to go back to normal. But there's also a realization that our lives will probably not be the same. And that's why it is so important that during these two days, you have been among those asking whether now is the moment for us to actually design a better normal, one that sees innovative recovery and new paths of possibility for actually shaping the world that we want. A reset, if you like. You've been asking an important question. What does sustainability look like post-COVID-19? So I encourage you to not let this moment pass you by, to not be mere observers. Seize the momentum and be bold for your voices and visions are needed. It cannot be said often enough. We are utterly interdependent and mutually vulnerable on this earth. And it is together that we will save lives and livelihoods. I thank you in advance and I wish you all good health. Um, merci beaucoup uh, à ces mots uh, mouvants de l'honorable uh, Elizabeth Dotswell, de uh, la, la lieutenant gouverneur de l'Ontario. Uh, I just wanted to say before we close it, being a huge thank you uh, to everyone who supported to this program. Uh, our hosts, of course, are the Waterloo Global Science Initiative, uh, the SDSN uh, Canada, and the uh, Université de Laval. Uh, thanks, thanks as well uh, to the Government of Canada System World Development uh, Goals Funding Program and uh, the support from uh, Alberta Global Council for Global Cooperation, which I forgot to mention. I'm actually in the office right now, and the uh, banner, the visual map that you've been seeing behind me, uh, was the first ever one that was made at uh, at the at the uh, at the Together 2017 in Calgary. Uh, so thanks again to Alberta Council for Global Cooperation for the support. Uh, thanks to Alliance 2030, uh, the Perimeter Institute, and the University of Waterloo. And finally, a big thank you to our reporters. Uh, Jackson, uh, Jackson and his team have been amazing, uh, providing us all with all that, uh, all those summaries, all those sharp insights. Uh, thanks a lot to our interpreters that have been able to, uh, that have been keeping up with uh, uh, us switching from languages to languages, uh, talking really fast. So thanks again 
uh, the work is not easy, it's really hard. Uh, a huge thank you as well to the audiovisual and the IT team uh, at the Perimeter Institute for supporting all of these sessions and all the hard work that has been going behind uh, making all of this happen. Uh, and so, yeah, a great job, everyone. Thanks again uh, for all of that. And so, uh, here are a few things uh, that you can look forward after uh, the programming ends today. Uh, tomorrow's meeting are part of uh, our, our official side event uh, schedule, so please note that you can still sign up for them, uh, but you have to do that, of course, really uh, as soon as possible. Uh, these uh, sessions are hosted by uh, Consortium Accelerate uh, de Québec 2030 and uh, ECPR. <clears throat> in the climate in the climate caucus as well. Uh, tonight, uh, you also receive the daily digest from our partners at Future of Good uh, to provide some top line in case you missed anything, and uh, also uh, just some general insight and like perhaps uh, there will be more. They will also be providing some more insight and, publi and publishing a lot more things after the conference. So you know, make sure you keep up to date with those. I'm sure uh, the daily digest from today are going to be uh, long but sharp and really good to read. Uh, since we had like six session after uh, for six session per block. Uh, so I'm really excited to actually uh, dive into those. Uh, together as some organizers, we'll also be sending out a survey in the near future. So please, please uh, take one, two, three, five minutes out of your time to, um, you know, answer that survey. Surveys are really, really important uh, for the team to make sure that, you know, we can not only improve, but also get better. And I'm sure that uh, there were some things that we didn't like as much that we want to hear about because we always want to uh, improve and make sure that uh, we, we bring out a better experience uh, next time. Um, We'll also continue to upload uh, all of the uh, all of the sessions and the videos from yesterday and today to YouTube. So you know, stay connected to the together on some YouTube channel. And please uh, remember to tag uh, has to hashtag uh, together on some 2020 uh, whenever you're sharing any of this material on social media, uh, so that you can easily find us, uh, so that we can easily find you, but also people can easily find us. Uh, we're hoping to have, of course, it's all the pleasure to have more attendees uh, for the future conferences so that's also going to help us uh, get the word out there about uh, together on some uh, thank you again everyone for joining it's been a pleasure uh, hope you had a good time i had a good time and we have had people all the way from malaysia i yesterday i saw a comment that said it was midnight out there so i mean props to everyone that's joining from out of the country i can't even imagine being in my home country right now what well, i can but i'm just saying that it's uh you know it's really amazing to see that people are tuning in from all over the world and are staying up late to be able to to be part of all this conference bangladesh uh anywhere else friends uh so thanks to anyone that has been joining and uh i think we can all agree that you know although that although it was uh you know, although having this conference online wasn't the best uh, scenario that we planned, uh, I think we're all thankful that the conference has now, in a way, been made more accessible by having uh, it happen all virtually. So I think I'm really thankful for the fact that we've had people from all over the world be able to join and not having to fly all the way to uh, Quebec. And I think we can all agree that we can find uh, the silver lining into what is happening there. 4 a.m. in Malaysia. Oh my. Okay. So, I mean, good good night to you all. And again, thanks again for joining. Uh, my name is Yvonne, and I I was really happy to be your MC over the next two days. And stay tuned for more information through the newsletters uh, that will be coming to you. And good luck and have a good time if you're going to be attending the section the sessions uh, next uh, tomorrow. Thanks and bye.